Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. about 30 people here in the room at the ACEEE conference room in Washington, D.C., and we have online 64 people and more joining. My name is Naomi Baum, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, or ACEEE. ACEEE is a nonprofit research and advocacy organization working to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors. If you'd like to learn more about our work, you can check out our website at ACEEE.org. As part of my role here at ACEEE, I oversee two of our research programs, um, among other things. One of them is our Behavior and Human Dimensions program, which is of great interest to me. And for the last several years, I have also been one of the co-chairs of the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference, or BEC, um, which is part of what brought some of you here today. BEC is a unique conference in that it brings together individuals who don't often have the opportunity to share knowledge. Researchers, policymakers, facility program implementers, businesses focused on energy and behavior to achieve sustainable climate solutions. BEC is in its 12th year and it's co-convened by UC Berkeley and Stanford and ACEEE. And since its inception, it has sparked the creation of two companion conferences, BEC Japan and the BEHAVE Conference in Europe, which you may have heard of. The next BEC Conference is taking place in Sacramento, California, November 17th to 20th, and I want to encourage all of you to attend. And in fact, right now, um, you can actually apply to become a speaker at BEC. That is, you can submit a presentation abstract. Um, we have a program committee that is reviewing abstracts, and I would encourage you, we are seeking new and innovative research and applied work to achieve a more sustainable future. The deadline for submitting abstracts is March 25th, and you can go to the BEC website, BECCconference.org. This event is a webinar, but it's also an in-person networking event for the Social Marketing Association of North America, SAMANA. And this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. Um, we're delighted to be partnering with Samana in this way, and we hope that this will be the few, first of um, many future collaborations. Our presentation, our webinar today, is on behavior change theory and practices. Dr. Ruben Sussman, our speaker, will speak and present for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for questions from those in the room and online. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra Paradis, who is the president of Samana, who will give us a little bit more about Samana and introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, first, I would like to thank our hosts, uh, ACEEE and Beck, uh, for this beautiful space and the food, which is very yummy. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank our sponsor, Entercom. Uh, without them, a lot of a lot of these events would not be possible. Um, to tell you a little bit about uh, what SANA is, the Social Marketing Association of North America, and I understand it is a mouthful, um, it's, it, we cover territory from Canada, the United States, Mexico, and the Caribbean. So uh, we do try to do things in different languages. We try to as much as we can. But it is all volunteer. It's a nonprofit organization. And really, our mission is to support academia, practitioners, um, anyone who's in the behavior change space. So that includes energy conservation, public health, health communications, and then it, that also includes things like uh, behavior, um, sorry, design thinking and behavior scientists, behavior economics. So 
it sounds uh, like a lot, but I think we all have the same mission, which is really to influence people to help better their lives. Um, we take a lot of the principles from commercial marketing and apply them for social good. So thank you everybody uh, for joining us. And I think we can start. All right. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Ruben Sussman. I'm the Senior Manager of the Behavior and Human Dimensions Program here at ACEEE in this building. I'm also the co-chair of the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference, which, as mentioned, is happening in November. Uh, I'm very delighted to be helping to organize this first ever event, both in person and online. And I just wanted to take a moment to say to the people online, if you have any problems, we have Maxine here standing by, so just send a message in the chat window and we'll make sure we address that right away. So today I'm going to be talking to you about basic behavior change 101 theory and practice. There is so much to cover in this topic, there's no way we'll be able to cover everything, but I'm going to do my best to touch on a few basic ideas for theory and how to put that into practice. I've tried to incorporate, my main area of expertise is energy and climate change, but I also tried to focus a little bit on some um, uh, health examples. So let's begin. All right, some of you may have seen this, me use this picture before. Does anybody here have any idea what this picture is, if you haven't seen it? Anybody in the room could just shout out what you think it is. Systems? Systems. Pipes. Pipes, that's a good guess. DC plumbing. DC plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well actually, uh, if you look really carefully, you can kind of see this is one million little plastic cups, the kind of cups they use on airlines. Oh, wow. This is an image created by an artist named Chris Jordan. And it, in the early 2000s, he's put on his website that this is about, there's one million plastic cups about the amount that's used on American Airlines within six hours. So that's none of us sees the, the individual cups, or none of us sees the whole thing at once. It's part of the problem. We all see this. The, the individual. And so this is an example of a system problem, right? And obviously policy solutions are part of the uh, part of the answer. But I want to, as a psychologist, think about how to change what's normal. Like this is currently normal, but how do we change what is normal to be something else? And so I'm going to present a few theories on behavior change and programs that we can try to use to, to, to affect that. So the first theory is uh, Roger's diffusion of innovation theory. The idea with this theory is that there, the entire population can be divided into five major groups. And they are distributed in the population roughly normally, with uh, innovators and early adopters and laggards making the smaller proportion. Most of us are here in the early or late majority. And the reason for these names is that innovators are the first people to adopt something, then early adopters, then the early majority, late majority, and laggards. Um, I should mention that the innovation here doesn't have to be like a technology. It could be a behavior or it could be an idea. And so the way a behavior or an idea spreads through a population um, is through these stages. Now, if you're lucky, you're able to get your behavior to diffuse throughout the entire population or the majority of it um, in, these, in these stages. And if you think of an innovation kind of like a party, there's, you know, some people will go to the party no matter what, like maybe they know you, or they go to every party, and they're the innovators. The early adopters look at those innovators, and they sometimes go to some parties, they're selective, they don't need everybody to be there, but they, they sometimes care about the innovators. The, the rest of us, the early majority, late majority, they don't want to go unless it's a good party. So they, don't, they need to know how many other people are there before they get on board. So... Oh, with this theory, the idea is that if you can get these early people, you can see there's an, an inflection point right after early adopters. If you're able to convince about 15% of the population that leads to adopt an innovation, you're, you have a better chance of the, the idea, the behavior, the technology to be adopted larger scale. Okay, so how do we get people to adopt that in the, in the first place? Let's talk about a few theories of why people change their behavior or don't change their behavior. Now, I'm a psychologist, but I know that I don't own the market on this. There's lots of different disciplines out there and theories. There's economic theories, that people will do the right thing if they're given the right amount of information, 
and they'll maximize their utility based on that information. Social theories that we, we do what other people are doing, or that um, you know if you can tap the right people in a social network, it will diffuse through the whole social network. Psychological theories, you know, everything from cognitive biases that change the way we think to the role of attitudes and values and personality in determining what we do. Legal theories that we only act in accordance with the law. You know, we do this mental calculation that uh, how likely is it that I'm going to get caught and how bad is the, the consequence and based on that I choose to disobey or obey the law and uh, so that's a reason that people act in certain ways. And of course there's structural barriers. Sometimes people just can or cannot behave in a certain way because they don't have the opportunity. You can't take the train instead of the car because they literally do not have a train option. So these are some of the theories. Um, there's also theories of why people do not change their behavior. So uh, my former PhD supervisor, Dr. Gifford, actually coined the term dragons of inaction. And what he suggests is, yeah, there's some structural barriers. Like, yeah, if you don't have a train, you can't take the train. You don't have a recycling program, you can't recycle. But even when there are those programs, people still don't participate to the maximum amount they can. So why is that? And he suggests that there's like something like 40 dragons, but they roughly land in about seven categories. And he, he used this particularly to talk about climate change, but to some degree it's about, it's per, it pertains to other fields as well. So limited cognition, the idea that you know, we have these ancient brains that are better at responding to clear present danger like a mammoth attack than they are to an abstract notion like climate change. Uh, ideologies, the idea that you know, we don't have to do anything because some higher power will take care of it or technology will solve our problems. Uh, other people, you know, if everybody else is driving a Hummer, then probably it's normal to do and I'll do it as well. Uh, some costs, you know, I already bought a bunch of cars and they're, I'm paying for, you know, insurance on them. I'm not going to go out and buy uh, another bus pass also. I'm going to use what I've already put money into. Discredence, you know, we kind of bury our head in the sand. We disregard all the information, you know, it's a climate hoax. Those People are, it's a big um, conspiracy or something like that. And then limited be, uh, perceived risks, which is the idea that maybe we don't ride a bike because we're scared of getting hit by a car, or maybe we don't buy an electric vehicle because we're worried about the range and being stranded or something like that. Um, and then limited behavior. You know, I, I recycle, so it's okay for me to live in the suburbs and drive an SUV everywhere. Um, so, you know, I've already done my part. I might not be conscious, but that's okay. Uh, a limit on behavior or a barrier. So those are two environmental theories. Here's one that I came across just recently putting this together. This has to be more with health behavior. And health behavior is a little bit different than environmental behavior because typically a health behavior is more, there's more benefits to the individual and that's the motivation for the behavior. Whereas with environmental behavior, there are some benefits to the individual, but it's largely altruism or doing something good for the environment. So in, these, in this health model, they focus more on the individual motivators. And they suggest, as you can imagine, home B, uh, capability, opportunity, motivation uh, leads to behavior. So there's these two intrapersonal factors, capability, I'm physically or psychologically capable, and mo motivation, I'm uh, uh, unconsciously or consciously able to articulate why I want to do this or what my motivating factors are, and then the opportunity. So these are maybe social or physical opportunities. And the idea is that when these interpersonal and uh, external factors come, are suggest a behavior, it's going to influence the behavior. So in order to change behavior, you have to change one of these three things. That's the idea here. Now, you can also influence motivation through opportunity and capability. So if Let's say uh, you have the ability and the opportunity presents itself, then all of a sudden you might become more motivated to do the behavior. So that's another influence between the factors. And they also postulate a sort of reverse feedback. Once you've done the behavior, you might feel like you're more capable. You might feel more motivated to do it again. Maybe you've even, you even spot more opportunities to do it. So that's a combi theory of behavior. Okay. So now that we have some theories on how to change behavior, let's put them into practice talk about how to design a program to actually change behavior. So when you're doing, you're, you're implementing a behavior change program, yeah, I don't know what that is. It's just, <laughs> sometimes I put pictures in that have nothing to do with the slides. Um, 
<laughs> it does look like fun, though. Yeah, I agree. Um, dangerous, maybe? <laughs> anyway, uh, when you do a behavior change program, it's important to, custom, to customize and tailor it. Um, and so what I propose is a five-step process similar to community-based social marketing or the do-right method or a number of other methods that are being proposed. Step one, and I'm going to go into these in more detail in future slides, but step one is identify the specific behavior that you want to change. And uh, the more specific you are, the more likely you are to succeed, and the better able you will be to measure that behavior. So go through the process and identify the behavior first. Second, identify the barriers and benefits to change within that target population. So every behavior has different barriers and benefits, and even the same behavior among different groups of people has different barriers and benefits, different reasons people do it or don't do it. So make sure you do some, some research with your specific target population. Those are important steps. Number three, select behavior change strategies. So once you've identified the barriers and the benefits and the behavior, then you can go through and there's lots of strategies. I'm going to talk about a few of them and how to select them, but there's really a lot of options out there. You want to think about your goal first and then select. Number four, implement the program you've designed. Number five, evaluate the program. All right, so let's start with number one. If you're thinking about a health behavior, these are the typical health behavior domains. Disease prevention, so maybe you're targeting smoking cessation or dieting or whatnot to prevent disease. Care seeking or treatment adherence, getting people to stick to their uh, treatment regimens. You know, let's say it's a HIV treatment, which is very complicated or getting people to go to screenings, or healthcare delivery. So this is things like getting healthcare providers to wash their hands more frequently. Now, within each domain, you can have an individual behavior, and the behaviors themselves will, will vary based on frequency, how often they happen, intensity, how strong those behaviors are, and the duration, how long they last, or how, how long the whole sequence lasts. Now, just like with environmental behavior, any behavior, you want to pick a behavior that has the highest impact with the least effort. So it's the easiest one to do with the highest impact. And if you take your time to define the frequency, intensity, and duration, you might be able to better select a behavior. Now, I don't, I'm not an expert in the, the health field, but I know in, in energy, it's really important to think about the trade-off between how difficult something is, how frequently it happens, and how easy it is to change the behavior. So what I've noticed is you, know, you have this range of behaviors, so frequent habitual things like turning off the lights or washing laundry in cold water, uh, you know, occasional things like changing the thermostat setting, or infrequent things like upgrading your attic, and then extremely infrequent things like choosing where you want to live next to where you work. So just from my description, you could probably imagine you know, these ones, these earlier ones that happen more frequently, they're a much lower impact. These more infrequent ones are much higher in impact. But the catch is, so you'd be like, all right, let's just, let's just do these ones. Why even bother with these guys over here? The catch is that the frequent, low impact ones are a lot more easy to change, a lot easier to change. These extremely difficult, uh, these extremely infrequent ones are high impact, but they're hard to change. So when you're doing your calculus of what behavior to choose, think about these three factors and what's feasible and what you want to achieve. So here's an example of us doing this in real life, this first step. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the Energy Connect project at Atrium Health, which is the largest healthcare system in southeastern United States, and possibly in the whole United States, I'm not sure. And what they did is they, they said, OK, we want to reduce our energy consumption in buildings. How are we going to do that? They brought in people from all levels of building uh, management, from the maintenance staff to the energy managers to the vice president. I think you can see one of the vice presidents here. And through this various activities and brainstorming sessions, they, they pinpointed several important behaviors that had very high impact um, and were, they expected, relatively easy to change. One of them was getting people to log when they when they made a change in the building automation system so that somebody else could come back and then change it back to save energy. So 
That was a very important factor that they identified through this process. So taking time to identify behavior is important. Once you've figured out your behavior, the next step is to identify the barriers and benefits of that behavior. So go out and do surveys or interviews or focus groups or observe the behavior in real life. Whatever you can do within the target population, learn about what barriers and benefits exist. So here's an example of doing that from the city of Fort Collins. They wanted to upgrade their, they want to get people to upgrade their homes more frequently. So they went out and they did, they identified the barriers and benefits through focus groups, segmentation studies, mark consumer customer surveys. And what most people think is, you know, the reason people invest, uh, the upgrade is like, because they want to save money, the reason they don't upgrade is because it costs too much. And yeah, that's true, but what they found was more than that. They found that, you know, there's a complex technical decisions about the scope of work that people lack the time to meet with and select the contractors. They lack the trust in contractor proposals. And then what they liked about upgrading, this is things you could possibly highlight in a promotional effort, it improves health outcomes. It leads to higher level of comfort. So again, you're identifying things beyond finances here. Something you might not have thought of otherwise. So that's why good research is important. And so these are very controllable. They, they, they came up with a very good solution for dealing with these problems and promoting these benefits. Here's a health-related example. So uh, this study is about healthy eating by teens in Nevada. What they did is they conducted a focus group of actual teens in Nevada and a literature review. Uh, they, they saw what was done previously. And so they used uh, the four P's method, uh, which is similar but not exactly the same. Uh, when they talked about the product and the price, this being healthy foods, um, it was basically identifying barriers and benefits. And they found that taste enjoyment, the convenience and ease of the preparation of the food, and familiarity of the food was really important for this specific group. You know, if it, does, if it tastes good, if it's easy and it's right there, and if they're familiar with it, they'll eat it. They also identified other things, like the place. So they found that healthy foods seemed or were perceived to be less available than unhealthy foods in the places where they usually eat. So that means, you know, we should probably um, get people to prepare the food or get people to display it more prominently. And then how do we promote it? They also asked, what are the channels of communication that we use? What are the best ways that we can promote this? So, um, well, they said, you know, the people that are in our daily lives, like our parents and our siblings, would be good people to get this information from, to, to, to give us the foods. Um, Computer, putting this into computer games or music videos or billboards or cooking shows and other stuff. Remember, this is 2003. So uh, I guess now we'd probably be more like Instagram or I'm so not hip. I don't know. Like Snapchat? Yeah, they Snapchat that stuff. So um, uh, this is the, what they suggested. They also said at school, you know, maybe some food sampling or food nutrition related experiments would be good. And where can we, where can we um, provide these foods and these experiences? Almost everybody said at school cafeteria, library, or stuff, et cetera. All right, so again, good background research. Once you've done this, then you can decide what strategy you want to use to implement a behavior change program. So let's go to number three, selecting your strategies. There are lots of possible strategies out there and lots of things to think about. I'm going to give you a couple theories that might help you decide. First theory, sometimes called stages of change, also called the trained theoretical model. This comes, you got to see a lot of nodding. A lot of people are familiar with this, it comes originally from health behavior, but has been applied to environmental and other behaviors as well. The idea is that you go through five stages. Pre-contemplation is the first stage. You don't even know about the behavior, or maybe you're thinking slightly negatively about it. Um, at this stage, you might, I should mention here, it's important to, if you determine that people are at certain stages, you would approach them with different types of intervention, and that's why I'm presenting this. So at the pre-contemplation stage, people don't really know about the behavior yet. Maybe they're not even really thinking about it, or maybe they're thinking slightly negatively. At this point, you know, an awareness campaign, just getting people to, to be familiar with it might be helpful. But you're trying to push people along the stages of change to the next stage. So the next stage, we have contemplation. Here, people are thinking about the behavior, maybe it's six months out or so. You want to move them from contemplation to preparation by maybe giving them some, some more motivation and reasons why it's a good idea, explaining how it's important it is, using persuasive messages. At the preparation stage, they want a plan, so they simply they have made the decision to do it, and at this point, what you'd hit them with is something like, 
information about how they can go about it, what step-by-step -step process they can do to accomplish the behavior you're trying to promote. In the action stage, people are doing the behavior. They just started it or they're about to start it. Here, all you need is like a prompt or a reminder, a sign or something like that in an opportune place. And same with the maintenance phase. At this point, they've been doing it for maybe six months and they, they have to continue doing it. So some sort of reminder, contextual cue is very important. Here. Some people have eventually reached a termination phase where they don't really need to worry about it anymore. It's just kind of permanently changed. That doesn't happen very frequently. Um, but these are the main stages that you want to progress people through. So based on which stage they're in, you might think of a different strategy. Here's another way to select a strategy. You've assessed the barriers and you've assessed the benefits. So if you think of the barriers as being either high or low, the benefits as being high or low, you can kind of map them along the continuum. So um, Wes Schultz, frequent Beck uh, visitor, uh, I should mention, suggested this uh, strategy. So you map them, um, barriers high, low, benefits high, low, and you can kind of get four quadrants. Now if you have low barriers and high benefits, it's a really easy behavior to change, right? There's a lot of reason to do it, not very much reason not to do it. So you can just go with education, feedback, prompts at an opportune lo location, or cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means reminding people that their attitudes of behave about a behavior do not line up with their actual behavior. And sometimes reminding people about this creates cognitive dissonance and makes them change their behaviors. Sometimes it makes them change their attitudes. That's not great. Um, <laughs> but for easy behaviors, that could be helpful. And this is actually where most research lies. Here, you have the, the next most difficult, I would say, is probably the low, low barriers, low benefits. There's no real reason to do it, but it's easy to do. Here, you can just invoke social modeling, show other people doing it, or social norms, show what other people are doing, and it tends to change their behavior. In the high benefits but and high barriers area, let's say you're getting people to upgrade their attic or something. There's high benefits, but it's also high barrier. Here, you want to do something like make it easy for them, so like the Fort Collins people. Uh, they simplified the whole process and made it so that uh, the contractors didn't have to come to their homes as frequently, stuff like that. Soliciting a public commitment can sometimes help. Now this last quadrant, you've got some really hard behaviors, right? There's no real reason, there's low benefits and high barriers. For these, the behavior is going to be hard to change no matter what you do, but some of the quota, like so-called big guns might be incentives, you know, like paying people to do the behavior. Uh, or contests sometimes work. The thing I want to highlight here is like if you use a very strong incentive or strong punishment for that matter, or even a contest, people might revert back to their baseline behavior after it's done. And that's just a matter of the, the, the behavior, uh, behavior you're trying to target. But you know, if you, this is probably good for at least a short term solution. One thing that uh, Dr. Schultz didn't mention is you know, punishments and laws and taxes are also affected. Changing defaults or physical structure can be helpful. You know, most of you are probably familiar that when you change the defaults about organ donation, you make it an opt-out, people are more likely to, to donate their organs when you make an opt-in. Uh, physical structure, like, it's a good example of this one. Um, if bike you, lanes. say it again? Bike lanes. Bike lanes, yep, yeah, if you have a bike lane, people are more likely to use it. Um, oh, this is my favorite one. If you make the doors of an elevator slower to shut, it's going to be more effective than putting a sign saying, please use the stairs. People are more likely to use the stairs if the, the elevator is real slow than, um, <laughs> than just any other kind of strategy. So, um, okay, habitual behaviors. So let's say you're trying to use this desk job to support your catnip habit. Uh, let's say your behavior you're targeting is really habitual. Um, you might want to, or you want, it's a repeated behavior. You might want to think about Implementing a strategy that tries to get at intrinsic motivation. So if you're simply paying people to do the behavior, then when that payment is removed, the behavior might return to baseline. If you also engage people's feelings of pride or happiness, um, they might start doing it because they feel it's right or good, they feel good about doing it. In that case, it might continue to persist. There's also three important pieces to changing habits. Number one, getting people to repeat it frequently. Number two, setting up contextual cues. So putting people in a place where they're more likely to do that behavior. Um, you know, that's where suggestion, don't go to a bar if, you have, if you're trying to stop drinking. Um, or putting something on the door, whatever it is. Uh, rewarding behavior is really important at first, especially. 
Um, so if you set up these conditions, you're more likely to change a habit, and that's really important in the medical area. Maybe less so, still important in environmental, but perhaps less so. Um, and I, wanna, I also want to make a comment about timing. If you're trying to change a habit, a good idea is to get in there right as a major life change is happening. Because that is when habits are temporarily unfrozen. It's really hard to change habits otherwise. But let's say somebody is moving to a new house. That is a good moment to maybe give them a free bus pass and give them maps, directions to how to get there by public transportation because they're in the change period and they're more likely to be affected by that input, uh, intervention. So think about timing when you, when you select your intervention as well. All right. So customizing interventions, let's say the bottom line here, think about your goals. So if your, your goals are something like short-term habit change, you don't care too much about the long term, you just want to get um, an outcome right away, you know, use a strong punishment or a reward. Maybe do a contest. These things will work. They just might not last forever. Um, if you don't care so much about the short term and you're okay with it taking a long time and not seeing results right away, maybe you want um, something like a social network approach. It's, it's effective. You know, getting a champion to promote the behavior and attitude change within a network, that is effective. Um, and you might eventually change the culture, but it takes a while. You know, you combine it with other strategies, and you might have a short-term and long-term thing that works in a sort of global way. Um, but think about your goals before you design your intervention. If you're trying a one-time investment, you know, financial incentives are most commonly what's done. But I think more research really needs to be done in this area because this is an important behavior, and we need uh, maybe alternatives to financial incentives. So for your best results, change the context of the behavior or um, uh, uh, look at the context as an important opportunity for change. Target the specific behavior, combine strategies, and apply the theories that we talked about. All right, so let's get into implementation and evaluation. Uh, here's one example. This is an example I did. Um, I was asked to get people to change their fume hood use. Hands up, anybody familiar with a fume hood? Some people. Anybody not familiar with fume hoods? Okay, awesome. I didn't know what they were either. So um, this is a chemistry lab fume hood. The way it works is people do their chemistry experiments in there, and then the air is constantly being evacuated with this gigantic fan on the roof. So it takes a lot of electricity, not just to, fan, to power the fan, but to heat the air that continuously gets evacuated from the room. So I was approached uh, to get people to use, there's one thing you can do to reduce the energy consumption from these things. In this particular lab, it was called setting it to setback mode. If people close the, the windows and they hit the setback switch, which is right here, then they can uh, save significant amounts of energy. So our intervention idea was to, our target behavior is to get people to uh, use setback mode at night. And so our intervention idea was to go to each lab's meetings, they have these regular meetings, and uh, do an intervention called in, uh, mental contrasting with implementation intentions. It's kind of a health thing. Um, basically getting people to think about the behavior, write down how they're going to do it, and maybe barriers, and how they're going to overcome those barriers. Um, there was an engaged group, so it worked in this case. We also asked them to do this uh, public commitments um, uh, behavior, which is, you can't really see it, but it says, we asked them to stick these on their on their humans. I use setback mode at night. and we measured the use of the switch overnight for several months. We compared one group across on one side of the hall that received the intervention to a group across the other side of the hall. We visited their lab meetings, but we just said, hey, could you please use us, uh, use Fume Hood's switch more frequently? And we found the ones that were in the intervention group used significantly less over that period of time than we used the switch more often than the people across the hall. Here's a health-related example that I really like. I didn't conduct this study, but I really like it. Um, it's about training ambassadors to promote safe sex uh, in the homosexual community. So this was a, an article in The Lancet. It's been repro reproduced a few times with various degrees of success. 1997, they did this. They recruited popular homosexual men in gay bars. Uh, they, so they talked to bartenders and people that frequent the bars regularly. They recruited people. And then they asked them to come to a couple weeks of training where they would learn how to talk to other people about using condoms and other safe sex practices. They measured safe sex practices through self-report outside the gay bars. So um, 
they waited outside before, once before the intervention, once after, and they just asked them a series of questions about using condoms and stuff like that. They also put condoms in the, in the bars uh, with information there, and they monitored how many were taken. They had a nice design. They compared two cities that had the intervention, multiple bars, to two cities that didn't have the intervention. They just had the free condoms and information in the bars. And then they found that in the intervention cities, there was a reduced frequency of unprotected sex. And there was an increased number of condoms that were taken. So a nicely designed study, good outcome measures, and they actually found a successful, they found success. So this was one interesting social network approach for changing behavior in health. All right, so this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. If you want more information on how to design a good behavior change program in terms of measuring outcomes, talk to me later um, or send me an email. The key is one, control groups and deciding, a, uh, deciding on a good control group. And two, picking a, a really good outcome measure to measure your success. So control groups should be as similar to the intervention group as possible so you can rule out any alternative explanation. So what you want is, in an ideal world, two exactly the same groups that the only difference between them is the intervention that you implement. That way, if you see a difference between them, you can say the only difference is my intervention. It must be because of the intervention I did. If they're not the same, you know, if they're from different regions or if they're from different times or uh, there's something like these are the people that wanted to participate and these are the people that didn't ask to, well, then there's other explanations, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be because of your intervention. So picking control groups is important. I'll tell you uh, some designs that you could do to pick good control groups. And then your outcome measure. Try to measure the behavior as closely, so the outcome measure should be as closely related to the target behavior as possible. What I mean is, if your target behavior is getting people to wash their laundry in cold water, don't measure the entire electricity use of the entire building or the entire unit because you're unlikely to see an effect. What you want to measure is how often people use cold water in their laundry. Maybe you know a logger, a data logger, or a diary, or some self-report measure that's closer to the behavior might be more accurate. So um, that said, here are four designs from best to worst for picking control groups. Randomized control trial, where you randomly assign people to an intervention group or a control group that doesn't get the intervention. Extremely difficult to do in real life, uh, but is the gold standard. A little easier to do in real life, but still very good, is a quasi-experimental experimental strategy. A randomized encouragement design, where you just encourage people in one group to do it, don't encourage people in another group, and then you see the difference. Or recruit and delay, recruit and deny. I like this one. What you do is you basically randomly assign people to be on a wait list. So you get all these people that want to do the behavior, but then you say, okay, I'm sorry, we don't have space for everybody in the program. You're going to be on the wait list and you're going to get the intervention. You compare the people that are on the wait list to the people that are in the intervention. Match controls. Well, sometimes you can't randomly assign people. You just get people that seem similar on every dimension that you can think of that's important. Maybe the same income level, uh, same geographic region, same gender, or whatnot. And then finally, the least good but still better than nothing approach is pre-post. This is where you just measure the behavior before the intervention and measure it after in one group. Does anybody know why that's a problem? Okay, I'll tell you the answer. Yeah. The answer is that you don't. there could be external factors at play. Maybe there's a recession. Maybe there's a change in weather. Maybe somebody had a baby. You know, there's all these things that could affect the behavior uh, and they're unrelated to your intervention, so you can't totally rule out other things. Still, it's better than not having an evaluation. So, summary and conclusions. How am I doing on time? I feel like I went through very quickly. All right, doing all right. So, takeaway points. What's the point? There's three points. Number one, be targeted and specific. Number two, prepare carefully. Make sure you do your background research before you decide anything, and then test things out as you're going. So. That entire five-step process, that could be a test process. Then after that, you go and do it all again with a bigger, on a bigger scale. Um, and finally, evaluate systematically. Not enough um, groups 
and programs do this part, which is thinking about how you're going to evaluate when you're doing the, the actual design of the program. You might want to consult with you know, a, an evaluation company or some specialist in this area to help you design from the beginning an evaluation that's embedded in the whole process. So that's it for my presentation. Before, one last thing, if you guys are interested in this research, especially as it pertains to energy and climate, I highly recommend this conference, which I also happen to be the co-chair of. Uh, it's this year, it's happening in Sacramento. Um, Beck, Behavior, Energy, Climate Change, November 20th, 17th to 20th. And we're currently accepting abstracts. Social marketing goes over really well at Beck, so I urge you to, um, to submit an abstract for this. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions, both in person and online. Great, so the way we're doing this, because we have 120 people online, is we're also gonna, we're gonna alternate. So if anybody here has a question, we'll take a question from the room first, and then Maxine will uh, tell us what somebody online has asked, and I'll answer that question. So does anybody here have a question? Or comment. Yeah, um, I'm going to stumble over trying to articulate this, but as I looked at the different approaches, um, are there some that work better for groups when you're trying to change you know, population behavior change versus individuals? Are, are groups ever considered sort of organisms unto, under, unto themselves, if you know what I mean? It's a good question. Um, so as a psychologist, I'm personally inclined to believe that groups are made up of individuals, so targeting an individual can change a group. But I think what you're asking about is organizational behavior, and when you're talking about an organizational decision, what additional factors might be at play? And there's, there's certainly like intergroup dynamics that you'd have to think about, things like, um, uh, what are, um, I'm trying to remember the terms, um, uh, groupthink, where people tend to uh, go along with the consensus as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to disrupting group harmony. There's group polarization that happens, where people in groups tend to have more polarized opinions than people would than than would be had individually. Um, and of course, there's all these social norms issues that people tend to be affected by what others are thinking. So when you want to affect groups' decision, you really have to think about who the important players are, like that, the most influential within that group. And you have to think about the processes that might, the these sort of additional intergroup processes that might be, uh, or intra-group processes that might be influencing decision making. It's a much more complicated um, decision. The other additional factor is that motivations are slightly different when you think of at work versus a personal behavior. So at work, for example, in the energy world, people are thinking about the bottom line a lot more than they are about comfort and, um, uh, and health and stuff like that. In, in the business world, uh, sorry, that's in the business, in the, at home, you, know, you can sell like a, a home upgrade all on health and environment and, and these other things. Even if it's not cost effective, people might go for it, you know what I mean? So I um, hope that answers that. I see your question, but we're going to go online now. There's a comment. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry, just to she can jump in from the public health world. Yeah. Um, we have something called the social ecological model, which um, looks at all the kind of different uh, organizational levels of, of people in society. So it starts off at the individual level, and it looks like knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors within the individual. Then it goes to the interpersonal and how those relationships can impact behavior. Uh, and then organizational community and then like society and at that point you're looking at policies laws things like that so that also might be something to, to look at as you're yeah absolutely that. and policies are really way you know uh, what we don't look at very much as behavioral scientists is the effects of laws and uh, and policies and incentives and taxes and stuff like that that is important those are important drivers of behavior and like you said they, they work at the society level so I personally believe that you need a both top-down and bottom-up approach simultaneously to make real change. Um, Maxine, online? Um, well, I think this is the question maybe a lot of people have about the slides being available. Oh, yeah, the slides will be available online. Uh, I'll, well, actually, the recorded webinar will be available as well on, you, on YouTube, I think. We'll, yes. we'll be able to post it, yeah. 
Um, and then we have one question here about the hundredth monkey theory um, and uh, whether or not uh, behavior change takes 10 years. And what's your opinion is about these myths about behavior change? So I'm not familiar with the hundredth monkey or that myth that it takes 10 years. Uh, that said, I do think that we need to have some patience. We're not going to see a lot of these things take time. If you look at the anti-smoking campaign and how long that's taken, I mean, you could argue it's taken 40 years for, for smoking to get where it is today. And if that's what's necessary for climate change, you know, we are anxious because climate change needs to be tackled now. But we also have to be aware that behavior change takes time. There's no set amount of time, and uh, it depends on what your you know, what the topic is and what your strategy is. But we do have to, you know, I think, especially in the energy world, utilities like fast turnaround and to be able to see the results in one year or two years or whatnot. Um, behavior change does take time sometimes, uh, depending on what you're doing. Uh, over here. I was gonna just build on this discussion about um, addressing behavior change at organizational and community levels. And there's a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, and you may be familiar with that. It's been out a while, which is interesting uh, concept about the larger group think and how they come to decisions that end up kind of being the decisions you should be paying attention to in many ways. So mm. it was just an add-on. It's called the, um, what did I just say? <laughs> something <laughs> something of something of group. The Wisdom, Wisdom of, of Crowds. crowds. It's an of crowds. excellent book about behavior change and more than just the very small play. Yeah, there's a lot of fascinating research on mm -hmm. groups and how people change when they're in groups. Uh, I remember, so I'm Canadian. Uh, there, I don't know if you guys remember, maybe not because you don't care about hockey in America, but <laughs> the, this, this team called the Vancouver Canucks got to the, the, the final bit of the cup. And, they, uh, and when their team lost, there was rioting in Vancouver and they destroyed the city. And there was like these kids that were honor roll students just smashing cars. And they, you know, they completely changed who they were because they were in this group. And so that's just a great example of how people change when they're in groups compared to when they're individuals. Um, do we have a question from online? Yes. Um, so we have somebody here who's asking um, if you could comment on the need for statistical power and pre registration evaluation plans for behavior experiments. So the question is about stat stats, basically. Statistical power, pre-registering your, your program before you, your, your research idea before you actually do it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with um, uh, statistical power is the idea that you need a certain number of people. You need to implement the intervention in a certain number of people in order to have the ability to detect an effect if there is one. So if you are trying your behavior change program on 10 people, and it's, it has a very small effect. You know, you're not even giving yourself a chance of seeing that effect. There's too much noise, differences between those people to see something. So what the user online is getting at, and I think is important, is you really should consult an expert on statistical power if you're not sure. If you don't have a lot of people in your sample, you may not, it might not be worthwhile doing a certain type of study because you are unlikely to see a significant difference or a significant impact. The other thing about registering before you, you do the study is uh, the idea that, <laughs> this is more of a for peer reviewed set academics, um, there's a lot of people like to publish and put out stuff that says, we, we did this and it worked. And sometimes people did something similar to that, but then they focus on what they found worked and they made that the important piece that they were focusing on, and then they published, look, we, we meant to do this, and we did this, and it worked, when really they meant to do something else. And so the idea of pre-registering, there are these online databases, you could say, this is what I'm gonna do, then when you actually do it and you find something, you can say, look, and we said we were gonna do this beforehand, we're not pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. So all this is getting at the idea that we need uh, to be really rigorous with our with our methods for designing and implementing these programs. One caveat that I would say is that you don't need to be an expert in statistics or behavior change in order to want to, to make a change. Um, work with somebody who is, 
Or at the very least, just think of these basic premises. Try to, con to include a control group. Try to measure an outcome variable systematically. Think about your goal in advance. If you can do those, those things, then it, you know, that's bet you're, you're off to a much better start than most people get. So I would say try to be as rigorous as you can, but it's not absolutely necessary for you to do something. Yeah, so applause in the background. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, do you have a question? I do, yeah. I was wondering, you know, in our world that is very online and now social media and everything nowadays, are you finding that there are more strategies that are employing social media and that kind of a bit more hands-off, so not a direct in-person, something you see, feel kind of approach? Are you finding that, that people are starting to employ these, these, you know, online other world social media strategies in behavior change? Super good question. I actually am not familiar with that. The problem with academia is that the literature lags behind the research. So you do a study that takes a year, then you go through the publishing process and it takes six more months. By that time, technology's completely changed. Every study that I've read about the internet is old and useless. And so it's really, really hard to, I just don't know who's out there doing that stuff. I know that, I suspect, that Russians are during uh, behavior change <laughs> research on social media, although that has yet to be borne out. Um, so people are doing it. I just don't really know the research on it, and that's an important, um, an important area to, to move into. I think uh, online. Um, so we had someone who was curious to know how the Fort Collins um, Home Upgrades Program to, uh, addressed their barriers that they are in. Yeah, so they had, uh, they were trying to get people to upgrade their homes. They had a few strategies, and to, I thought they were actually remarkable. They were able to uh, get a hotline set up that was one place where people could ask for a home energy assessment. And they had all these, they had a number of um, groups or contractors working together and agreeing to this. So when somebody would get a call, they would send the next op uh, contractor on the list. They agreed to standardize prices, which is pretty amazing. So the contractor was able to go in there, do an assessment, provide a package of upgrades immediately, and do that upgrade without much difficulty. And so instead of there being an average of six to seven home visits and having to call multiple contractors to, to make sure that they, um, to compare prices, they had one trusted source. These people had to be certified. And they were able to reduce the number of visits from six to seven that people had to take time off work to like two to three, I think. Um, and so that in conjunction with a number of other sort of things that were able to give assurance to the homeowner that it was um, uh, trustworthy, were able to, from what I saw, significantly impact the number of home upgrades that were done. So that was a really impressive program, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question uh, for me: Could you speak on the uh, the structural barriers piece, right? So that the question is around, you know, for behavior change. You know, a lot of times that there's a push, you know, for people to do something, but then there are uh, structural barriers, as you call them, that are preventing people from doing certain actions of their own selves already, right? So. The idea of if we were to take away those, those trends, get people and just naturally do the, the behaviors we would want them to do. Um, can you talk like about that, or you know, if there's any uh, uh, concepts or strategies or thoughts that, that you have around that concept? Hmm. Yeah, it's as you pointed out, all the best nudging strategies in the world will not get people to ride the train if the train doesn't exist. For example, it's really important that when we do an assessment and do our background research, we look not just at the things, so it's easy, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're a psychologist and you're familiar with social norms, you think that that's the solution to every problem. It's really important that we recognize that there are other things that are affecting behavior. In many cases, your values and attitudes and um, personal motivations are not even the biggest effect on, the, on behavior. So I think, when I say that we need to do background research, you need to look at uh, for, like everything in the whole system. Like people can want to change, but don't have the ability to do so. That's an important feature. Yeah, 
And I, I, I want to give a little plug for knocking down these barriers. A lot too many psychologists think that you know we can't do behavior change is only about getting people to change their attitudes or nudging them with decision choice architecture. Sometimes the best solution is just moving the bus stop or changing the place where people pay or something like that. That needs to be considered. Yeah. Uh, is this a further follow-up? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry, I get very excited about this. Um, so just to kind of add on to that, it, it also might be helpful to consider media advocacy. So having like a PR campaign or something where you're trying to raise the awareness that this is a structural issue and who's affecting it, possible solutions. So that can be one way to address those structural er um, issues. Um, and then also just to say there's an amazing free resource called Theories at a Glance. This is from the National Cancer Institute, and it has a whole bunch of behavior change theories, and it's organized by the social ecological model, which I referenced before. Thank you. So theories at a glance. Yeah. Just Google that. Do uh, we have a question online? Yes. So um, what happens when you cannot pick a specific behavior, but you need people to change multiple things, like, for example, getting a city to meet their climate goals? Right. That is when you have to break it down. This is exactly the issue. If your goal is getting the city to meet its climate goals, you will not succeed or be able to measure success. You need to break that into pieces and then address each piece. So um, maybe uh, you have to do an analysis of what the highest impact strategy would be or what multiple strategies would, like what multiple behaviors might be most important what behaviors are easiest to change, what people are doing in that community. Once you've identified that, then you can go and try to make that change. It's, it's hard to get a, a, an organization to meet its climate goals, um, and so there will be multiple strategies necessary, but I strongly recommend breaking it into pieces that are, that are manageable. And I, I should also mention, behavior change is not the only solution there. You're going to need, you know, structural changes, you're going to need new bus stops maybe, or um, bike share programs or what have you, bike lanes, things like that. Yeah. So I used to run the recycling program for DC public schools. So I worked for the DC government. There's always like a fantasy of mine that one day I could actually run my program informed by, you know, this type of research Right, but I never had time for that. Like, it was just never anything that I could do, even though I knew a lot about it and, you know, I would love to. So I guess my question is, <laughs> there's obviously structural barriers to people in government, you know, being able to make decisions about how our programs work in this way. And I'm just wondering if that's something that you're working on or... It sounds like your barrier is like the person implementing the program doesn't have time to do the program. Well, you know, I don't have time to evaluate, or nobody's giving me a budget for that. Yeah. Or, you know, and yeah. that's this is not, I'm in a new life now, or I started my own company, but that was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in government generally, yeah. you know, obviously, it would be, you know, we should be doing things and changing our programs based on whether they're actually successful or not. Right. But that's not really how a lot of decisions actually get made, yeah. even if you have somebody who actually is, you know, kind of open to it. Right. Although the mayor does have the, the lab. I mean, there is an initiative that I tried to work with. <laughs> but, but I don't know. I'm just wondering kind of in general whether that's something people are working on or you're yeah. working on. Uh, this gets out that organizational behavior question that we were talking about earlier. You know, how do we change the behavior of an organization? And, you know, one, in one, I don't know if this applies in this particular situation, but if you're pointing to the fact that you have external programs that, is, that are, you're advocating that they should be done this way with a proper evaluation, you could hopefully tell somebody that we should be doing this internally as well. Um, and if this is a, an organizational priority, so this is kind of the cognitive dissonance or hypocrisy method, you know, the line that people's behaviors are not measuring right, like other behaviors. Um, it really, so this it's a really tricky situation. Um, my best solution for internal problems like this is to try to identify influential people that are that could be on your team, and then gaining enough 
credits to kind of ask for change. There's the social credit theory, which is, or what is it, the uh, uh, idiosyncratic credit theory, which is that you just gain credits by conforming to a group, and then you can eventually cash in those credits and make change. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what's going to work in your situation, but these are some ideas about intergroup processes. Human life. <laughs> uh, online? Um, yes, could you please explain the uh, recruit and delay slash deny method again? Yes, I'm really excited about the recruit and delay. <laughs> so, what you do is, let's say you have uh, people that you want to test this new type of um, psychological therapy on. You want to say, okay, these guys are going to use the, I don't know, like cognitive psychological, psychoanalysis, behavior therapy, whatever it is, you want to see if it's useful. Well, there's only space for 50 people in the program. So you recruit 100 people, and randomly, or maybe the first 50, get put into the program. And the next 50, you say, we want to have you, and it's actually unethical to not give them treatment, we want to have you, but you have to go on the waiting list, and we'll see you five months after this first group is finished. Okay, that's a bad example because psychotherapy might need to be yeah. <laughs> more urgent. But um, this is the basic idea. And then you would compare the people that are currently getting the treatment to the people that are on the wait list. And the idea is the people that are on the wait list are very similar to the people who are in the treatment. They also want the treatment. You can see if they are the same age and demographics, but it's likely that they will be. And yet you're able to provide the service to everybody, it's just, you're able to provide the service to everybody to meet your obligations, but you're also able to do a randomized control sort of trial. Um, you could do this, I've seen this done with um, energy, where one, so they wanted to test this app along with something that gives you, so like, they wanted to see if this app that gives you specific information about your home and gamifies it, uh, is better than just a generic app that doesn't have information about your home. And so the thing that gives you the, enter, the, the information about your home is like this device that you clamp onto your, like, that's a, what's called, fuse box. Yeah. And so people would download the app and order the, the thing, and half of them would get it immediately, and half of them would get it later. And they were able to compare the people that got it to the people that didn't. It was a really nice control trial to show that this thing really made, saves energy when, when uh, you have feedback. Maybe, I mean, those people were exactly the same in almost every way. They seem, you know, generally exactly the same, large enough sample. So you could say, like, the only reason they saved energy was because we gave them this thing and this group and not. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. How did the Fort Collins people get the contractors to agree to a price? <laughs> Good question. I'm sorry, I don't know the details of that. <laughs> but I, you know, that takes a lot of network building and a lot of interpersonal skills. And as you, you've identified, that is an important piece to this as well. Um, interpersonal skills are just always helpful. Um, uh, Follow up then, yeah. what would you call them in the system of behavior change? So the end goal is to work with the client, the homeowner, on improving their energy use. What are they called? What are, who, they're a player in the system, you have to work with them. Is there change specific, their behavior too. Is the con are you talking about the contractor? The contractors, the yeah. Is there a specific title within behavior change theory that I should be looking up? I'm sorry. If there is, I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds like there's some expertise in the room. It just feels, I, I was thinking of it as a kind of infrastructure problem. It's not physical infrastructure, but it's part of the system. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. it's the governmental regulations because they simplified and streamlined things. They made a single call in point. It sounds like they expedited the permitting process mm -hmm. as well as getting all of the contractors to agree to the same charges. Uh, that that all feels like a lot of. I mean, it's more on the per interpersonal side, but not entirely. And it, there's a lot of structural elements to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll go in the back and then over here. I just wanted to add to that that that's like influencing, making behavior change on the uh, decision makers. Yeah. And you know, it's a common thing to say that we often do our research, you know, focusing on those who are don't have a lot of power because we can recruit them, and we don't mm. study the behavior of the decision makers. 
So that's really, that's a key part of doing this kind of work is figuring out how to influence those decision makers. Yeah, over here. I was going to make the same point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks for bringing that up. It makes it, it makes a very important point about it. You know, I should mention the city of Fort Collins is like from the top to the bottom. They're interested in climate and, and energy issues. It's like it's just uh, the kind of the kind of place where everybody's on board. So that's why this sort of approach might have worked. It might be a different approach with a different group of people in a different place. Uh, online. Um, okay. So this person says. Large organizations may be too complex to separate into controls and target groups. Um, you know, with factors like internal politics. How do you design a, a good program with proper research aspects? Yeah, uh, the uh, I guess the question is, how do I do a good design when everything's messy in the real world? <laughs> <laughs> that is the key. Like yes. Uh, it's often not possible to do your ideal design. And it, that shouldn't prevent people from trying to do something. I would suggest, you know, as I mentioned, even pre-post evaluation is better than nothing. Don't do the don't do the intervention if you can't measure success. Like that, I think, is a basic requirement. But if you can't do a randomized control trial, don't let that stop you. If you have a very small sample, think of different like think of doing more interventions to make the effect bigger. Think of Maybe um, doing different types of evaluation, qualitative things, as opposed to just quantitative. Try to get something out of it, um, but don't not do it just because you ha you can't do it perfectly. Um, yeah. You made a point earlier, and I think it seems applicable here, is really the low-hanging fruit. If you've got a lot of things that need changing, we're, um, our organization is going plastic-free, so we have... Uh, committed to that and it, instead of doing all of it we're saying well, what top three things are we going to set as our goal what are the things that are going to make the greatest impact at this point um, what are the things that people can actually do and the easiest to replace what they're least likely to do so just those kind of analyses I think is a is a starting point yeah yeah I'm trying to most people on board who are likely to do it yeah yeah try to do a behavior that's going to have the highest impact for the least effort um, and uh, we're short on time. So I think uh, that's going to be the end of, the, of today's broadcast. Thank you very <laughs> much for coming. To the uh, mingle and uh, enjoy the... Oh, wait, oh, wait. Yeah. There's one more final announcement. Not that line, just in person. Yeah. Thanks, online. See you guys. Um, I just, my name's Kelly, you guys have probably all got obnoxious emails from me or seen me on LinkedIn and uh, the event, right? But um, thank you all for coming. I want to thank Ruben and Aishi and um, Beck and Naomi and all folks. Um, so I do have a few announcements. We actually already have our April meeting um, scheduled and organized, which um, is really exciting. So Westcat up in...